Voyager is at an outpost run by a group known for travelling far and wide, where Janeway's listening to some schmuck tell her a tall tale about a giant space whale or something. They're interrupted by Kez introducing another traveller, who tells us that Schmuck's story may not be entirely accurate, which, given that we're here to learn more about the region, does somewhat affect its usefulness. Schmuck doesn't take kindly to the insinuation, and it looks like we might have a bit of a Han Solo moment. Thankfully, he's a coward as well as a liar, and, after some gentle persuasion from the new guy, he toddles off. The new guy's name is Zaheer, and I can't figure out why, but my brain is telling me he's a shifty git. Perhaps it's because Kes seems rather taken with him, and we know how poor her taste in men is. To the holodeck, where the Doctor is talking to simulated versions of historical figures. We learn that this is an attempt to improve his personality by sampling the best aspects of others, though this currently seems to involve listening to Lord Byron and Mahatma Gandhi talk about shagging. Kes arrives and starts gushing about the travellers, and Zaheer in particular. The Doctor suggests that she should be cautious of Zaheer, and that her interest may be a rebound resulting from her breakup with Neelix, making the sort of separation we saw in Warlord official. Oddly, the Doctor seems to disapprove of her involving herself to such a degree with a new culture, which feels rather at odds with his history of mentoring her. Perhaps it's a desire to protect her from misplaced affection, as he states, but maybe there's an element of jealousy there too. Not necessarily romantically so, though the episode projections suggest that this is a possibility, but she's the person to whom he's bonded the most, after all, his closest friend, so any perceived threat to that closeness would affect him greatly. But, again, I digress. Later, in sick bay, the Doctor is treating Balana for a bit of a dicky tummy she developed on the planet. He's also acting like a filthy sex pest until Balana threatens to knock the holographic shit out of him, after which he tells the computer to disable the additions he's made to his program. Looks like he went ahead with those modifications, a decision that Balana suggests to him was a bloody awful idea, not least of which because he's still rubbing her leg. She'll come and fix it later, but doesn't have time right now. Back on the planet, Kez and Zaheer are taking a walk through a space forest of space fir trees, perhaps planted in preparation for Space Christmas, before we're given the obligatory multiple moon shot to remind you that we're in space. They chat about how different their lives are, his solitude versus her being part of a crew, and they compare the appeal of certain aspects of both. We reach a rock with some LEDs in it and have a bit of a kiss, while some hooded weirdo watches them, and I'm calling it now, that's Neelix. It's three in the morning and Kez is just getting back to the ship, causing a few turned heads and some concern from the Doctor. He's worried her behaviour has become erratic, resulting in neglected duties. She pushes back, saying her private life is just that, a response that I note doesn't address his concern, but he lets it go anyway. Later, she's handing a report to Janeway while looking like Hollywood's idea of utter dog shit. Janeway guesses correctly that she's been up all night, and we start a conversation about Kez's future on the ship. She's not sure what she wants anymore, only that she feels a desire for something different. To that end, she suggests a trip with Zaheer. They could rendezvous with Voyager a little later, and she'd have an idea if her future was still with the crew on board. At three years old, I suppose this is the accompan equivalent of a midlife crisis, the realisation that you're only going to get more and more decrepit, and an increasing number of internet memes won't make sense to you. Eventually you fold in on yourself, rejecting modernity to the extent that you spend much of your time making pointless fucking videos about TV programs that aired when you were a kid. (sighs) Anywho, Janeway seems agreeable to the idea of Kez exploring her options before they move on, though she does seem far sadder about the prospect of Kez leaving than she was about Enton Deathnell getting murdered in the last episode. We're down on the planet, and Tuvok is getting data from Zaheer about the surrounding area of space, or at least a cylindrical section of it. After pointing out a particularly nasty bit, Tuvok inquires if Zaheer intends to take Kez anywhere near it, and Zaheer reassures him that this won't be the case. The Doctor isn't the only one concerned for her safety, and it pleases me that the normally taciturn Tuvok makes this known to Zaheer. Afterwards, Zaheer's walking alone through that space forest with the space fir trees in again, He thinks he hears someone and pulls his gun, only to be knocked off a cliff by the hooded creep from earlier. It's probably going to turn out to be the lying schmuck from the start of the episode, but my headcanon's still going to be that it was Neelix and he framed the guy. 
Hooded creep arrives at the bar where lying schmuck tells him they're closed, so I guess it wasn't him after all, and the hood's pulled back to reveal... well, I didn't see that coming. Looks like it's not a shapeshifter of some sort either, as he's wearing his mobile emitter, something we see as he forces lying schmuck's hand into the fire. Guess we're going with those personality changes turning him into murder dog. He demands a ship and orders lying schmuck to arrange it, something that probably would have been easier to do with two working hands. Silly murder doc. Back on Voyager, Kez boots the dock and tells him that Zahir has been attacked. He's alive but is a bit fucked up, and she wants the dock to help treat him. We get ready to teleport to the planet, only to be interrupted by Belana. She's detected a problem with his program caused by those new additions he made, and wants to run diagnostics. To the sick bay again, where Belana explains that he's proper bollocks things up. The people he chose to splice into his program have brought the darker aspects of their personalities with them, so it looks like we have a Jekyll and Hyde situation going on. Balana tells the Doc to deactivate himself so he can purge the tinkering, but things go awry and he does a bit of flickering before Balana gives her best surprised face. Janeway and Tuvok are discussing the attack on Zahir. There's absolutely no forensic evidence at the scene, almost as though the assailant didn't have a physical body to leave any. Bugger all that, though, as they found Balana unconscious. They restart the doc, who tells them she passed out because of that dicky tummy from yesterday. She'll be fine, but needs watching. As they leave, they ask the doc to check over the forensic results we were told we didn't have from the attack, saying his instruments are more precise than the ones used to gather the data, but let's ignore the logical fallacy in that request. After they'd gone, the doc does another bit of flickering again and turns into murder doc, before gathering up some hyposprays and looking menacingly at Belana. He wakes her and demands to know how to purge the doctor so only murder doc remains, but that simply isn't possible, a bit like Hyde asking how to safely cut Jekyll's throat. Looks like he's running out of time too, as the flickering he's experiencing is a symptom of the degradation. Dissatisfied with the answer, he knocks her out and sets off for the holodeck, believing his personality donors have the answer. He follows an unknown ensign into a turbo lift and asks for deck 14, which is curious given that the holodeck is on deck 6, but maybe someone's renumbered them for a giggle. On the way, Murder Doc gets some murder urges, only to be murder cock-blocked by Paris. They leave and we arrive at the holodeck, where he starts the resort program with all those historical figures in it. Back on the planet, Tuvok is questioning lying schmuck about Zahir. He denies being involved in the attack, despite that whole pulling a gun on him thing. Zahir himself arrives and we depart to the site of the attack to look for clues. Meanwhile, Kez is checking up on the Doctor. Unable to find him in sick bay, she tracks him down to the holodeck, where we find he's done some dodgy shit to those other characters. On seeing Kez, he grabs her badge and forces her to the teleporter room, where he poops yellow on the attendant. I guess Tuvok being down on the planet is why nobody notices the security alert that a weapon discharge should have set off. Looks like the Doc has given up on fixing himself and is now simply looking to Scarpa. He does a tricorder science thing to prevent Voyager from tracking the teleport, and away we go. Kim tells Janeway about the teleport and we try to contact Kez and Murder Doc without success. Janeway gives Chakotay and Tuvok a call to let them know, which doesn't seem like a logical step to me, but does give Tuvok a chance to tell her that he's detected holographic bobbins at the site of the attack. As an aside, this does raise the question of why they didn't scan the site themselves before instead of bringing useless data to the Doctor, but let's ignore that for now. Janeway orders them to try and find the Doc and Kez, and we also give a point to the writers here for her remembering about Balana and sending someone to check on her. Janeway says she'll try and do a science on the ship to track the teleport. Murder Doc and Kez are in Lying Schmuck's pub, with Murder Doc poking his emitter to try and fix the instability of his program. While he does, we have a bit of a po-faced speech about how he's a more accurate representation of humanity because he's a complete bastard and thus more deserving of existence. Kez argues the opposite, and seems to be getting through to him that it may be possible to preserve them both before Lying Schmuck turns up and ruins it. He's got them a ship, but they'll never get away now because Janeway knows where he is. Murder Doc threatens him a bit and he legs it, then Murder Doc grabs Kez and Scarpers too. He decides to go through the space forest with the space fir trees, which is handy as that's where Tuvok and friends are. They pick up Murder Doc's trail and follow, helped by Janeway who's managed to narrow down their position. Murder Doc and Kez make it to that cliff Zahir took a dive off earlier. Some yellow poop appears from Tuvok and friends and dislodges a few rocks, blocking the path ahead of them. 
Murder Doc threatens to jump off the cliff with Kez, which isn't much of a threat when you consider that Zahir survived it, but maybe his species is made of flubber. Murder Doc has another bout of flickering, causing Tuvok and Chicote to conclude that the Doctor is reasserting control over Murder Doc. Quite what data they're basing this on isn't provided, but fuck it, cause we're going to delay him anyway. Kez launches into a monologue about how Murder Doc is really trying to protect her, as he could have killed her at any time, suggesting that the good inside him is still there. His rebuttal of her argument is quite convincing, as he jumps off the cliff. Tangentially, that's quite a drop Zahir managed to survive. Maybe he really was made of flubber. Regardless, the drop ceases to matter, because Janeway's managed to break through the science thingy and teleports them back aboard. They're greeted by an armed security team and Kim for some reason. Oh, and the doc's back to normal now, because reasons. The doc tells the security team to put their guns away, and they immediately comply with the guy who just tried to commit a murder-suicide. Later, in sickbay, Balana's letting the doc know she's deleted all the bullshit he added to himself, and he apologises for the bit where he threatened to torture her. She leaves, and Kez arrives to tell him and us that she's decided to stay on Voyager. I guess she discovered that Zaheer snores or something, but she doesn't seem that bothered by it, so let's forget about him as quickly as she has. She and the Doc exchange pleasantries about being glad she hasn't left, and the Doc recites the Hippocratic Oath as we fly away. Okay, so the premise isn't terrible. Murder Doc is mostly fun, and Kez's desire to explore other options isn't entirely out of the blue when you consider how short a comp and lifespans are. It all kind of sputters out at the end, though. There are no satisfactory conclusions to either of the plot threads we had running, as both essentially end with, and then they went back to normal, the end. Why did the Doc's unstable program become fine? Reasons. Why did Tuvok and Chicote conclude that it would? Reasons. Why did Kez instantly decide that Zahir can go do one? Reasons. There are parts of the script that come across as more than a bit stiff, too. We have moments where we try to achieve a mood that's not supported by the quality of the writing, the main culprit being Murder Doc's monologue about the nature of evil. That's not the fault of the actors, they do what they can with what they're given. I was born of the hidden, the suppressed. I am the dark threads from many personalities. Those are lines I wouldn't be surprised to read on the character sheet of someone's first D&D character, not here on a high-profile TV show. That Robert Picardo can deliver them with a straight face is to his credit, but the quality undermines the believability of a character that's supposed to be the personification of selfishness. I'm sure there are people listening to this who'll say that it's better to aim high and miss than aim low and hit, but I'd invite those people to apply that logic to a urinal. Writing operates on much the same principle. If you can't shoot straight, you're going to be left with something that stinks. End of episode.